Ah yes, the Mario 64 iceberg. Chances are, you've already heard of this thing. That's probably why you clicked on this video, because you want to know more about what dark, unknown secrets lurk within one of the most influential childhood games of all time. Turns out, there actually are some pretty interesting secrets hiding in the game, and it took decades of research and devotion to uncover them. Some of the secrets are simple, but some are far more consequential, or sinister, than we ever imagined when we first picked up that N64 controller. Some even say every copy of Super Mario 64 is personalized, usually by a way ahead of its time AI, that uses anything and everything available in the game assets to fit the gameplay to you, the player, specifically. This iceberg is largely inspired by those original ideas, which spawned countless creepypastas and spooky urban legends. Of course, despite what a few diehard fans may say, this 1996 game is certainly not personalized. The game's source code has been leaked and data miners have found little to no evidence of this phenomenon. It is, however, a very fun idea, and it is this idea which is more important. It has led to variations and full-on remakes of the original game, sometimes just to satisfy the urge to see a creepy tale about the game brought to life. Strap in as we board Bowser's sub for a trip down the Super Mario 64 iceberg. You want to see something really cool? Check this out! Whoa! What am I, a monkey? Uh, you can zoom in, zoom out, change angles. Go anywhere you want to go, do anything you want to do. System. L is Real 2401 is one of Mario's most infamous mysteries, coming from the plaque on the star statue in the garden behind the castle. On this plaque is some very blurry text, courtesy of the graphical limitations of game development at the time, that many presume to read L is real, followed by the number 2401, and some dedicated Nintendo fans spent years deciphering its cryptic meaning, always coming to the conclusion that Luigi had to be in the game somewhere, despite never making an appearance. Heck, even Yoshi makes an appearance atop the castle after collecting all 120 stars. So where was the Mario franchise's second most popular character? Well, as it turns out, Luigi was really in the game, just not accessible. On July 25th, 2020, which was 24 years and one month after Mario 64's initial release in Japan, a leak containing the source code assets for the game revealed that a model for Luigi did indeed exist, but was never actually implemented in the final cut. Makes you wonder. Space World 95 Beta is another name for the Shoshinkai Beta, a build of Super Mario 64 that was debuted at Space World, then called Shoshinkai, in late November of 1995. This beta build was notably not the same as the alleged uh, July 29, 1995 build of the game, which actually features lower on this iceberg, one level away from the bottom most darkest section. A number of mechanics and designs for the beta versions were totally different, such as Mario spinning after performing a triple jump, and Peach's castle looking like it comes straight from an alternate universe, uncanny in that some levels are in the same place, but nearly none of the design is the same. Speaking of parallel universes, Parallel universes refers to an interesting phenomenon wherein the player's coordinate position exceeds the 16-bit integer limit using calculations for Mario's movement. And this causes an overflow to occur and returns an unexpected result from the code. Basically, if Mario gets going fast enough to shoot out of bounds and pass a certain faraway point, and we mean really fast and really far, then the map will essentially loop back around. This is called a PU, or parallel universe, because while it does appear normal at first glance, it is missing much of the life that makes up the main universe version of the level, consisting mostly of terrain and such. Oh yeah, and all the textures are missing. Apparently, players have reported game crashes and even console malfunctions due to the overflow nature of the values used in the glitch, so it can be considered slightly dangerous to perform. Uh, Pan and Koek 2012, one of Mario's greatest and most determined players, has famously made use of these PUs, and they even get used in the tool-assisted speedruns for the fastest possible time to beat Mario 64. Uh, since we mentioned Pan and Koek 2012, let's mention something that they have had to explain quite a few times now. The half A press is essentially a trick used to perform maneuvers in a stage which require the A button to be currently in the held position, but does not require the player to have it pressed down within the stage. Therefore, a player can press down on the A button to perform a required jump uh, somewhere in the castle to enter a stage, but continue into and throughout the stage without letting up on that A press. Since one A press does the job of two in this case, it's called a half A press. That's pretty much all it is. Just an interesting little idea. The impossible coin slash Goomba refers to a coin on Tiny Big Island and a Goomba on Bowser in the Sky, which both exist outside of the regular bounds of play for Mario and thus could not theoretically be collected or defeated in normal gameplay. 
Clever players have since proven that both the coin and the Goomba can be interacted with through very precise manipulation of gameplay mechanics, and the reasoning for why they are out of bounds in the first place has been easily chalked up to bugs from development, making this particular part of the iceberg less mysterious than it was years ago. The Womp's Fortress Tower 1-Up is a well-hidden 1-Up that you can get by breaking away the bottom of one of the tower's side walls with a punch on Womp's Fortress. It's probably here because most people have no idea it's even on the level, including me. I had to load up my game real quick just to make sure this 1-Up really was there and not just some urban legend. Uh, it really, really is there. The Bob Bomb Battlefield Bridge Hang is just something you can do under the bridge in the first stage. If you stand under the lower part of the bridge and jump, holding the A button, you can hang onto a phantom ledge that results from the bridge's texture not exactly matching its collision box. A minor detail, but sort of interesting. Okay, we've gotten through the easiest part of the iceberg, where only a little bit of info is visible, and we're still above the surface. Let's dive below the water, though, and explore a level deeper. A little... darker. Big Boo's unused text is a piece of leftover text that was unused in the original game, which specifically and solely mentions Luigi. The line simply reads, Luigi, Luigi. It was probably intended to be something Big Boo says to Luigi, but of course, Luigi didn't make it into the final cut of the game, and neither did this text. Ghoul Metal is another piece of text from Big Boo's haunt that players have ruminated upon, perhaps far too long. If the player survives the mansion, the sign says they should get a Ghoul Metal instead of a Gold Metal, and likely just to play on words, but that doesn't stop players from claiming they've seen this Ghoul Metal in-game, however. Don't Become His Lunch is a line that can be read on a sign in Hazy Maze Cave near the pool of water Dory is swimming in, referencing the sea dragon directly. Only thing is, Dory is female, and completely harmless. Shh, please walk quietly in the hallway, can be found on a sign in the upper part of the castle, on the side of the stairs. It could be interpreted as menacing, but it's more likely that it's just some throwaway text that developers hardly thought much about. Dancing flowers are an unused object that probably would have acted similarly to the snow and lava bubble effects in their respective stages, with small dancing flowers cropping up as Mario passes by. Sadly, we never got to see these flowers in action, but you can observe a butterfly sometimes if you're quick. Volcano blocks are the ruinous columns near the hot foot into the volcano star in Lethal Lava Land. They're not particularly interesting, other than that they have a texture not seen elsewhere on the stage, which is purported to look metallic. Though if you ask me, I would just as easily agree that it's just some stone ruins. Blarg is an unused reddish dinosaur enemy in Mario 64, inspired by their counterpart that appeared in Super Mario World. They would appear uh, in lava, uh, popping out to attack Mario, but they never made it into the final cut of the game. The blog model even remains rough and unfinished. Bugged fire texture refers to the fact that the smoky texture that appears behind Mario when he gets burned and starts running is fairly low quality, and this is because the texture is rendered with the wrong texture format in the code. Fixing this one line gives a much smoother texture that originally never saw the light of day. Big Dud is what the Pink bomb -oms call King bomb -om after his defeat. Sure enough, a third rolling ball is in the pit at the bottom of the mountain. A pretty rough fate for the king. Womp King turns into the castle is pretty vague, but I presume it means that the Womp King at the top of the stage is essentially pounded into the ground as the literal foundation stone of the tower that appears afterwards. A uh, pretty grim end for the kings in this game, but it does make a bit of sense. E.T. in Pyramid refers to a set of hieroglyphs inside the pyramid on Shifting Sandland, where the letters E and T next to each other can be clearly seen. Or is it so clear? It's possible that it's something else, and coincidentally only appears to be the letters E.T., but it's hard to say. Maybe aliens built the Mario Universe pyramids? JRB Vanishing Fog refers to the environmental fog that lays low on the level when first entering Jolly Roger Bay. After getting the star for plunder in the sunken ship, though, the fog is lifted and the stage is a bit brighter. The change goes fairly unnoticed by most players, myself included, but it does seem to fuel the fires of Mario 64 being personalized, as the level looks different at different points of play. Unagi Tunnel is an alleged area of Jolly Roger Bay that can be accessed by going into the tunnel the eel, or the Unagi, comes out of initially with the star on its tail. It's supposed to be a creepy underwater level that exists in personalized copies of the game, but let's be honest, it probably just cropped up from how it seems like you should be able to enter the tunnel that the Unagi exits, but you just can't. Secret Aquarium is just the name of a level that hosts one of the castle's secret stars accessible through a hole near the ceiling in the room with the Jolly Roger Bay painting. The stage is just a big windowed box full of water and fish, so it's definitely got an odd vibe to it, but it's not particularly secret. Mips throwing refers to the fact that Mara used to be able to grab Mips by the ears and throw it normally. This development detail comes from Miyamoto directly, so it's a strong source, and you can apparently still see Mario toss Mips in the finished game by taking the rabbit underwater. That's kinda wild. The yellow cap switch is an unused asset that didn't make it into the final cut of the game, much like Blarg or the Dancing Flowers. It also comes with its own transparent floating box, and it seems like it was intended to activate the yellow boxes that held items like Koopa shells within. In the end, the yellow cap switch was cut, and the yellow boxes were made available to Mario from the start. Broken Paintings refers to the idea that personalized versions of Mario 64 contain torn paintings, which uh, are damaged versions of regular paintings. Speculation on such paintings rarely agree on how they operate, in that some are said to lead to glitchy versions of their respective stages, and some simply reveal a hidden space behind the painting with a reward. Some theorize the phenomenon occurs naturally, some say it can be caused by punching or kicking the painting enough. Who knows? 
The mirror room is, of course, the room with the giant mirror wall that can be found behind a door on the upper level of the castle. It hosts no man's land, which is entered much like Shifting Sandland is entered by jumping through a wall. There are a couple of oddly shaped pillars, are they podiums, here that seem to do nothing, and the mirror is just used to hint to the player that Snowman's Land even exists, since the mirrored version of the room does have a painting on the wall. However, mirrors have always fascinated and spooked people through the ages, and this mirror seems to have much of the same effect on players. When I was younger, I used to think there was something hidden in the mirror too. I tried and tried to figure out if it held a secret we just didn't know about yet. The Diaz version of the game put to rest any mysteries, however, as Luigi can simply enter the mirror side of the room, uh, go through the mirror door, and get a simple castle star inside the blank room. That's all. Yoshi's saddle just refers to the fact that the saddle in the finished game has a red trim instead of its usual white, which is apparently a minor oversight on the texturing. And finally, the only things in this section that I can't really explain are HMC Alcove and JRB Box. JRB Box is probably a reference to the crate on the ship in Jolly Roger Bay, but I'm not sure why it's on the iceberg really. Don't get me wrong, the fact that the crate was so dangerous despite being literally just a box was always off-putting. I really didn't like that box, but it's not really too mysterious. I guess we can wonder what's in it. As for HMC Alcove... I presume this is the cave behind the waterfall with the green cap switch for the metal cap, but as strange as that small area is, it's never struck me as all that weird. Maybe they're referring to the rumor I've heard that is a drainage pipe leading into the, one of the water worlds, but your guess is as good as mine. Introducing Nintendo Score 64 and win at Taco Bell. Just peel the coin off the lid. Score 64, and you could win an N64 system, cash, or millions of other great prizes. And who knows who'll win the Porsche Boxster. It's Score 64 and win. Only at Taco Bell. Yo, listen up. We will not live in a two-dimensional world. We won't go in one direction or see where we can set. We will walk through walls. We will take a look around us. We will not be confined. We believe in the path of least limits. We won't be told how to view the world. But we will experience true freedom. We will not compromise. We will live the game through our hands. We will be in control of something. Change. 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 We will change the system. Zelda 64 Beta Assets in WDW refers to the small town in Wet Dry World accessible by the player only after altering the water levels on the map and traversing to the cannon. In this town, there are assets such as doors and buildings which very, very closely resemble those found in Zelda 64, which you might know better as The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. The idea is that both development teams probably worked closely enough that they might have shared some assets, easing up strain on one or both teams' workloads. Of note here is that I've read that Metal Mario's texture was taken straight from a Link texture in Legend of Zelda, which may have been referencing the Dark Link texture in Ocarina of Time. WDW Skybox is another secret surrounding Wet Dry World. Get used to it, because there's a few of them here on this iceberg. People really don't like the vibe of Wet Dry World. This mystery revolved around the eerie image of an almost realistic looking town being used as a skybox for the world. Anywhere you go in the world where the sky is visible, you can see that image in the distance every time you look up. Turns out, this was an image of a real town. Mario enters WDW early in the Got Milk commercial is what is listed on the iceberg, but as far as anyone can tell, the Got Milk commercial shows a player with 37 stars in Wet Dry World. No mystery there, since it only requires 31 total stars to get there without glitches. Maybe the iceberg's creator experienced a Mandela effect with the commercial? Cold Cold Crevasse is actually in the original Mario 64 game. Yes, finally. An unheard of secret stage from the iceberg that's actually real. Oh. Oh, what's that? It's just mentioned on a sign in Cool Cool Mountain. There's not actually any Cold Cold Crevasse stage in the game. Don't tell that to the internet, though, because apparently this stage is popularly recounted as one of the stages from personalized copies of Mario 64. Did we really need another snow stage, though? Womp's Fortress Interior is the idea that one can enter the fortress through the tower that appears atop the island. Some players have claimed that their copies of the game have a door on this tower that allows them to go inside to another part of the world expanding Womp's Fortress immensely. This concept probably arises because the stage has fortress in the name, but we never enter any fortress during the level. Chances are, the island is just the fortress that was mentioned, but in the debug menu, later shown in the video, the stage was just called Mountain as a Whole. 
LLL painting fireball refers to the fireball face on the lethal lava land painting. At first glance, it makes sense, as it is a fire-based stage. But if you think about it, all the other paintings feature an image of the world they lead to. If there's any paintings at all, this painting just shows a fireball. And the fireballs don't even appear in this Mario title. It reminds me a lot of the Bowser face that appears in the screen when you die as well. How Bowser got into the castle with this sub refers to the idea that Bowser infiltrated Peach's castle by entering through an open port that can be found in Dire Dire Docks, where the sub now rests. This port does lead to the castle ground, so there is some relevance to this theory. I never really questioned how the sub got into Dire Dire Docks, because that big hole in the side of the level that was also underwater kind of gave it away for me. Real question though, how did that ship get into Dolly Roger Bay, hmm? Big Boo's Haunt Forest refers to a stage from personalized copies of the game known as Big Boo's Forest. The idea likely stems from the spooky moonlit woods in the skybox of Big Boo's Haunt, which seems like an excellent idea for a stage, though I've never seen it. Big Boo's Secret Laugh is a somewhat ominous laugh that plays by random chance and can be heard anywhere on the stage. It's probably here because it only plays randomly, and people don't usually pay attention to those background sounds. Haunted Dirt Texture is the idea that the dirt texture in the game has a creepy face in it. There's not much here if you ask me. It's a common phenomenon known as pareidolia, in which people tend to perceive meaningful images in random patterns. The end screen refers to the final image that displays after beating the game and the credits have rolled. There's a weird shape behind the cake in the foreground, and vague shapes are supposedly visible in the corners of the background. Again, probably just some pareidolia, but who knows? The shape behind the cake really does look a bit like Yoshi's face from the front. Debug menu names refers to the names of stages that can be chosen from the debug menu's level selection. This wouldn't be particularly interesting on its own, but these level names are not what you'd expect. I guess the developers forgot to change out these names in the debug menu because, honestly, what gamer really even knew it existed back when it was released, so what was the worry? Here are some of the more interesting development names for stages. WTGG and Tinboutu, which apparently stands for Water Dungeon and Submission for Jolly Roger Bay, Horror Dungeon for Hazy Maze Cave, EXT1 Yoko Scroll or Extra 1 Side Scroller for Bowser in the Dark World, EXT3 Heaven or Extra 3 Heaven for Bowser in the Sky, and Just Mountain for Womp's Fortress. Oh yeah, and can't forget Donkey and Slide 2 for Tall Tall Mountain. There's plenty of empty slots in the debug menu as well, as there were clearly more levels being planned, even late into Super Mario 64's development. 120 has spiritual significance is apparently a reference to angel numbers, which have, as the name of the secret implies, spiritual significance to some people. Who knows? Mario is Freemason initiation is exactly what it implies, in that Super Mario 64 was meant to get kids ready to be initiated into the Freemason someday apparently. I doubt very much that this was the case, but that hasn't stopped people from making the connections. From the castle's Freemason style designs, to the coins which feature five pointed stars that could be strewed somewhat as pentacles, which apparently have been tied to Freemason imagery. Honestly, I don't think Mara's a Freemason chill. Sorry conspiracy nuts. Yoshi ends it all, the actual name of the secret as listed on the iceberg would get this video spanked by YouTube so I'll just say it like that refers to something Yoshi does after you talk to them after collecting 120 stars. Yoshi turns around, runs towards the edge of the castle roof, and jumps off. Uh, yeah, that kind of sounds bad, but the reality is that Yoshi can survive much greater heights than Mario and many other characters can, so Yoshi probably just jumped off and scampered on back to their island or something. Skyboxes or photographs is the idea that the skybox images are photographs of real world places. Probably not, but hey, I've heard weirder. Original resolution textures is the idea that there are higher quality original renders of the textures from Super Mario 64 since all we have now are the lower resolution versions from the game. It would be pretty neat to see some higher resolution textures for Mario 64, but with all the work put in by ROM hacks and the like these days, I don't really think it's necessary now. Maybe interesting for gaming history. Islands in the distance refers to some small islands that can be spotted in the horizon of the skyboxes of Baba Battlefield and Tiny Huge Island. It's a neat little detail to spot, but there's not much here that's worthy of note, except that some players believe personalized copies of the game allow you to visit these islands in another stage. Rainbow Ride Village is a supposed area in personalized copies of the game that appears in Rainbow Ride. Only thing is, this village actually did appear in Super Smash Bros. Melee, which is why some people may think it's in Super Mario 64 too. Bob-omb Village 
is another village area from personalized copies of the game, and this one is often inexorably tied to a beta image of a brown hill, atop which a sombrero man stands with three bob around him, which is probably what inspired the idea in the first place. Secret slide dimensional rift refers to the voids in which the slide levels appear to be placed. People have theorized this is a rift in space, existing between dimensions where only slides can be found. I don't know. It's a cool idea, I guess. I like it. The slide dimension. Tower of the Wing Cap True Location refers to where the Red Cap Switch stage is actually located in the Mario world. Nothing can be seen below the clouds at the bottom of the stage, so for now, it's anyone's guess. True Locations of Painting Worlds relate to the Tower of the Wing Cap's true location I just talked about, in that the stages depicted in the paintings appear to be actual places in the Mario world. The strongest indicator of this is that Dire Dire Docks leads directly to the castle grounds, which is also the method by which Bowser is theorized to have entered the castle, as mentioned earlier. So, where are the other stages located? Something to think about. I saw a cool video that I'll link in the description where someone prototyped a version of Super Mario 64 with the stages actually in the same open world as the castle, and I think it's a pretty neat idea. Removed courses refers to unused or otherwise completely removed courses that Miyamoto and the team intended for Super Mario 64 to ship with. Some of these courses that were in the game but not utilized were 2 Test, 32 Night, 35 Poison, and 3 Kinop, as well as a blank stage called Moto's Factory which was likely a testing ground for the Moto's enemy which ultimately also went unused. Miyamoto and the team initially wanted there to be double the number of stages roughly that were implemented in the final cut of the game, but deadlines and hardware forced expectations to be dropped before release, leaving us to wonder what else the team had up their sleeves, and what a fully fleshed out Mario 64 would have looked like. Nintendo 64 is here. Get into it. Imamade no telebi game dewa jisnen deki nakatta computer graphics animation no hakuruk. Nintendo 64. Sandy stick o tsukatte hajimete taiken deki ru atarashi game no sekai. For this part of the journey through the darkest layers of our beloved childhood game, it may help to see through the lens of a child's eyes. If you first picked up the game when you were younger, then use those memories and nostalgia as the anchor for your perspective. Imagine you're sitting on a carpet in front of an old CRT screen, your new Nintendo 64 jacked into the back, smooth plastic controller in the palm of your hands. You blow in the bottom of the cartridge, as one does of course, and slot it into the console before powering it on. The game whirs to life. The bright colorful logo pops up on the screen with a twinkle. You hear those seminal words. It's a me, Mario. And you know you're in for an evening of discovery and challenge and fun. If you didn't play Mario 64 back then, or just never got around to trying it, then think about how you felt playing your favorite game of all time as a kid and use that as your guide. Of course, as usual, Mario starts in front of the castle. Kid you runs up the slight slope between you and the castle instead of taking the path all the way around. You bound across the bridge to go inside. Exploring a bit, you chase the big boo at the end of the back hallway and take the door into the castle courtyard. When you exit from the castle's back door, however, you turn around and pause to look at it. You've never really looked at it before, mostly because you spend all of your time actually inside the castle. This time, though, you notice the frame of the door is not really the standard frame, but rather a thick border of bricks that doesn't quite match the wall around it. You reason to yourself, 
It probably means Bowser smashed through this very door right here, and the Toads had to rebuild it back up with new bricks after he took over. You head back in the castle and straight into the main lobby foyer. You remember something a friend told you at the playground at recess at school earlier that day. They said they'd managed to get through that painting of Peach that turns into Bowser at the end of the hall behind the first star door. You reason it's not entirely impossible because you've always thought there had to be some way to get in that painting. If only you could just get past that invisible barrier. Try and try as you might, you just can't surmount that obstacle. You long jump, double jump, triple jump. Heck, you even try the triple jump and dive. But every time Mario just bonks his head on the barrier and falls into Dark World. Oh well, you tell yourself. Maybe your friend just knew something you didn't. You'll figure it out someday. What did they say was behind that painting, anyways? You think about your conversation about the Bowser painting. You press your friend on it at lunchtime at school, asking things like, How did you do it? And where does the Bowser painting even lead to? Naturally, your friend didn't want to give away all of their secrets, but they did lean in real close and whisper, You want to know where it goes? You nod your head swiftly, eager for any new info about the game. It goes to the Bowser room, your friend says. The gray brick room, completely empty, except for a platform and a window. What's out the window, you ask? Hooked on their every word. All you see out the window, they say, is Bowser, staring in at you. You take that in, a bit spooked at the idea of Bowser just eyeballing you on the stage, but absolutely dying to see it for yourself. The reality of the Bowser room is that it was a tiny joke uh, made by one of the gamers on the YouTube channel Oni Plays, and it ballooned out of control into a whole meme. The meme originates from the image that was made to accompany this joke, which you can see here now. Yeah, it's not particularly impressive, and it definitely wasn't real. Something that was real, though, is the fact that Toads were literally turned into bricks by Bowser's power in Super Mario Bros. Don't worry, though, the breakable bricks were not the Toads, rather just the power of bricks. Supposedly. So it's no surprise that some people have theorized that in Super Mario 64, Bowser has once again turned the Toads into bricks in the castle. Heck, Toad even tells Mario to his face that they and the princess are all trapped inside the castle walls. Once again, players may be reading too much into some simple dialogue, but it can be construed as meaning that they are literally inside the castle's walls. After all, don't some Toads have power stars ready to hand over to help Mario in his quest to defeat Bowser? Just like those special brick blocks from Super Mario Bros? This all ties in with the idea of toad projection, and Peach being behind the stained glass window at the front of the castle the entire time. Since toads appear more like apparitions, fading as you move away, much like the boos fade away as you approach them from the front, those who believe that toad is literally trapped in the walls theorize that the toads you interact with are just projections, like a physical version of an astral projection or something. To add to all that, Peach, who Toad claims is also trapped within the walls with them, also projects out from the stained glass window when Bowser is fully defeated, implying that she, too, was literally inside the walls the whole time. So you're back at your N64 again. After you failed to conquer the Bowser painting that your friend swore could be entered, you still wanted to discover some new secret in the game. You figure you'll go to one of the weirder levels, Hazy Maze Cave. HMC, as it's called, has all the hallmarks of a spooky level. Dark pits leading to a black abyss. Enemies like giant eyes, bats, and bugs. Plenty of spots to drown in water or burn up in fire. The best thing is that it's designed like a maze, meaning you never really knew if there was some secret path hidden in there, perhaps some turn you never thought to take that would unlock an entirely new sub-area. You don't find anything but the usual stuff there, and after trudging through to the hidden cave that hosts the metal cap switch and finding nothing of note, as usual, you let the running rapid sweep you away and out the end of the cave. Except instead of simply dying and coming out of the HMC painting, which you just now realize is more of a hole full of liquid than a painting, you fall down the waterfall into the castle moat. Wait a minute, has he made his cave the giant drainage pipe for the castle? Indeed, there's plenty of evidence to support this. While calling it a septic system may be a bit too specific, HMC is indeed basically the sewers of Peach's castle. 
The entrance is one of the lowest spots in the basement, which is a bit flooded despite the other levels in there being based on lava and sand, and all that water seems to drain right through HMC and out into the castle's molten lakes. While this has spawned some rather hilarious theories, such as the rolling rock boulders supposedly being reimagined as balls of waste, as you might say, I haven't heard anyone mention how Dory spends all her time waiting around in sewage water. Poor Dory. Speaking of the metal cap, did you know that the metal Mario texture has an entire history behind it? Even if you know a part of it, the whole story is actually hard to piece together due to all the time that has passed, as well as all the rumors that have spread on the internet like a game of telephone or grapevine. So for those who have never seen it before, here in all of its grandeur is the original image used for Metal Mario's texture. Okay, okay, well it's not all that grand, I give you that, but that's just the low resolution version that was used to save space and memory for the game. Here's the original resolution image that Nintendo ended up editing down. Yeah, that's some flowers, alright. Uh, power flowers, you might say. It all comes full circle, baby. That's pretty neat, but uh, notice I haven't said it's Nintendo's image yet. Because, well, it wasn't. For a long time, nobody knew the origins of the metal texture that's used for Metal Mario, as it goes with many textures in these older games. But it turns out... Somebody found one on an old computer by a now defunct company called Silicon Graphics, known by their acronym of SGI. Remember that name, Silicon Graphics. It's going to come up again, in a big way. For now though, let us return to our story where we left off, just having left HMC, making our way back up and into the castle. Okay. So, you know you can enter Dire Dire Docks through a rippling painting made of water which stands at the end of a hallway, the access to which is locked behind a star door that requires the power of 30 stars, or a well-placed yellow bunny rabbit if you know what you're doing. Except this time, as you open the star door, you find you can't get to that painting, somewhat because of the fact that between you and at the end of the hallway is a massive Wario head floating menacingly in the shadows and cackling, taunting you forward, but mostly because you can't even bring yourself to move your joystick one way or the other. In fact, you can't even move your thumbs at all. Your eyes are simply glued to the screen. Your pulse is beating in your ears like a drum. Something is terribly wrong. So much so, that your body refuses to budge an inch. That is, until the Wario head chomps at the air and slowly begins to move towards you. Suddenly, your focus sharpens, and your hands respond to your command. You pull a clean pivot 180 degrees and book it back towards the start door, Wario's monstrous head twisting and writhing hot on your heels, eyes glowing and spinning demonically. You want fun? Wario will show you fun! And heavy, funky, crazy music is all you can hear as, with not even a single moment left to spare, you slip through the star door, and it shuts behind you slowly, right in Wario's big, ugly face. You're safe now. Everything is back to normal. The castle music plays just as you would expect it to, but it's a bit of a pain to your ears. You have a grueling headache, and you're still overwhelmingly anxious. What in the world was that? You have to ask yourself, was that even real? There are a few mysteries in Super Mario 64 that can claim to be as infamous or as unnerving as the dreaded Wario apparition. Said to originate either from the personalization AI's desire to create fresh new content from existing game assets, or from players' unconscious desires and wishes for Wario to make an appearance in the game, the anomaly is often recounted the same. The player enters the hallway to Dire Dire Docks only to find a giant Wario head apparition floating in front of the painting. It slowly starts approaching, gaining speed, becoming crazier, shouting, and laughing at the player. After escaping, the player feels sick or nauseous. Many of the tales surrounding the Wario apparition say that players can even fall into a comatose state from some sort of shock, perhaps a shock delivered by seeing something one knows to be impossible with their own eyes. So take that all with a bit of a grain of salt. This anomaly gained popularity very early on in the timeline of Super Mario 64 as a still of the Wario operation was verifiably taken from an E3 1996 panel where Nintendo presented the Nintendo 64, becoming one of the game's earliest memes and cementing in Super Mario history a Super Mario mystery. Let's take a moment to talk about the mirror room again. Yeah, that room really fascinated people. And it makes another appearance, here, near the bottom of the list. 
It's tough to pinpoint which door exactly is referred to as the forbidden door, but it could be the door in the reflection of the mirror room, which Luigi can access with the help of a power flower in Super Mario 64 DS. Or it could be another door alleged to appear in some personalized copies of the game that leads to goodness knows where. Your guess is as good as mine on that one. According to Toad, the mirror room is also home to an ally with info, but it's hard to discern who exactly that ally is and what info they have. Could it be the hint in the reflection that a painting exists which you just can't see? It's hard to say because even though Wario can be unlocked through a stage found in the mirror room, Toad even tells Wario that there's an ally with info back inside. Hmm. After the Wario apparition, you're shaken to your core. You'd finally found one of those secrets you'd been looking for. But was it worth it? You don't dare touch your N64 for days. At school later that week, your friends are talking about games, and once again Mario comes up. You timidly offer up that you saw Wario before you even think about it. And then you realize, are they going to think you're crazy? But surprisingly, they all slowly start to nod their heads, one after the other. And your friend that made it to the Bowser painting says, Oh yeah, me too. Really cool they added the Wario. Uh, I always knew they, they would. You nod too, realizing you were probably just overreacting to something a bit creepy. And it had always been in the game anyways. Your friends didn't seem to think much about it, so neither did you. And soon enough, you picked the controller back up again. During one of your epic struggles against the King Koopa, Bowser himself, you notice that the exploding mines which surround the platform of the fight rest on a yellowish ball of some sort. In fact, these yellowed spheres remind you of something you've seen before. Somewhere else in this very game. Oh yeah, Wiggler's body is made up of these very same spheres. And then you realize the cold hard truth. Bowser's boss arenas are lined with the body parts of Wiggler's. Wow, you think to yourself. That's rough. While we're on the topic of the parts of Mario 64 lore that could be considered almost body horror, let's talk about the elusive brain diagram. Supposedly, there is an unused image file in the game of an actual brain. It's pretty low resolution, and it's even been alleged that it was meant to be the image used in the painting for Wet Dry World, as if that level really needed anything else to make it more off-putting, am I right? Speaking of WDW... It's time to conquer your very least favorite level, Wet Dry World. You have a good number of stars now, but that final star door keeps laughing in your face. You can go in, and you can walk up that final staircase, but you know you'll never make it to the top in this save file if you don't get all those stars. You need more stars, and that means playing the levels you don't really care for. Wet Dry World tops that list. It's always been a slog in your previous playthroughs even though the strange mechanics initially excited you. As you enter the world, landing on a wooden platform floating in the water, you take a moment to look up at the sky. This little action, an experience you usually find pleasant even in spooky maps like Big Boo's Haunt, is, here in this stage, oddly uncomfortable. You go ahead and play through the level, not necessarily having fun, but just trying to grind through the annoying enemies and wonky level layout. You grab the star next to the cannon and jump back in again. This time you open the cannon and shoot over to the other side of the map and swim to the flooded town. You drain the water, finish collecting your red coins, and go to grab your star. However, as you stand in front of the star platform, you turn Mario to look out over the village and you think to yourself, where is everyone in this place? What happened here? You know, something's just not quite right about this game. Especially that wet dry world. You know it's all wrong. But you can't really put your finger on why exactly. Your parents have a computer at home, and once they've gone to bed, you slip into the desk chair and boot it up. You figured out how to connect to the internet yourself, and you're ready to finally get some answers. You'd found something interesting. It was a singular post online, drowned out by a number of other more popular posts on the game. You noticed it in particular because of its title, You're Intrigued. Maybe this could shed some light on the development of the game that you weren't privy to before and put to rest your subconscious fears of what was otherwise an excellent video game. 
You read the post yourself, word by word. Hi, I work with a major distributor of personal game systems, and I have an old build of Super Mario 64 that I was given before the title was even released in the USA. I know it's old because I was given it by a friend in the business who I thought might be interested in buying it for my collection. It was in a box postmarked the 9th of July 1995, and it had clearly already seen a bit of play. It's nothing like the Mario I know at all. Some things are the same, but everything looks different. You just have to see it to believe it. You open the image links below the text in a hurry. There's only a few, and the quality is horrendous even by the standards of the time, but you can clearly see this is not the same game you've been playing, even if all the characters are right. You had to know more, and so you reply to the post. Did you ever see the castle change while you were playing? It's been a few days, but every night you've checked that post to see if the poster ever responded. And tonight, they do. This is all they have to say. Forget about it. I shouldn't have shared confidential Nintendo assets. I'm sorry. A few minutes later, the post is gone. Simply erased from existence. No trace of it left on the boards. You ponder what this could mean. Were those images fake? How could they even fake that? If they weren't fake, then why did he get so spooked when you asked about it? Miffed about this, and with more questions now than answers, you turn on your N64, even though it's well past your bedtime. You go up the castle to the top floor and stand right in front of the wet dry world painting. Why, oh why, do you make me feel so bad? You ask the painting, knowing you're talking to nobody but yourself. But something replies. You're an adult now. It's been years since you've touched Mario 64. Heck, it had been years since you'd even thought about that old game. You'd downloaded an N64 emulator and a Mario 64 ROM, enjoying it for a bit, but ultimately finding it to be missing... something. Maybe you reason that without that three-pronged controller at your fingertips and a flickering old TV screen to give it that authentic retro feel, that nostalgia just doesn't hit as hard. Your old friend, Nintendo 64, is collecting dust in a raggedy, ancient old box somewhere on an attic shelf. You decide to dig it out and clean it off, interested to give it another go, for old times' sake. Once you've got it all plugged into an old TV you also found stashed away in the attic, you blow into that cartridge one more time. And for once, dust actually does come out. But when you boot the game up, immediately, it's wrong. The title screen starts wicking. Mario's face looks unsettlingly glitchy cutting around the screen like a bat out of hell. The music is familiar, but disturbingly pitched. You slam down that power button on the console and wait a moment. Uneasy. You press it back up again and the game begins once more. Normal, this time. Whew! For a second, you had panicked flashbacks to those stories you used to convince yourself were real when you were a kid. Hank, you'd even fooled yourself into thinking some of them had happened to you. You play through a bit more. None of your original save files remain, except for one file that must have been someone else playing at some point. Maybe a cousin or something. You chose this file to play because why not? It was in slot A anyways. You go up the stairs to the second level, figuring you'll nab a few of these stars from Wet Dry World and push to the final Bowser stage that remained locked so far. You jump into the painting and within moments, Mario 6 is landing into the stage. Except this Wet Dry World is nothing like you expected. Actually, it's a lot like you remember. All the textures and enemies are the same, but the layout is totally wrong. Yet it all seems so... familiar. You know this isn't the same level you played as a child, but brief bits of muscle memory and tiny shreds of actual memories get you through a couple of minutes of play before it finally clicks. This was your save file. The last one you ever played before you stepped away for good. This strange new version of Wet Dry World was what drove you to do it too. It was the final straw. You power the game off without so much of the save, Wondering if that other version of the level really ever existed, or if this was always the way it had been, and the game you really remember was just in your head. The days of the personalization AI lording over players in Super Mario 64 is, if it ever existed, 
virtually dead, as PC emulation offers a much cheaper, more accessible alternative to buying a decades old console with the game and peripherals to go with it. We know this because data miners have poured over every inch of the game's files since the huge Nintendo leak recently and found nothing in the way of personalization of any kind. Though they did find Luigi, which I consider to be the biggest one of them all. Anyways, the earliest emulators predated this leak by many years though. So how were the original N64 emulators made if they needed the source code to emulate the software? As it turns out, the most recent leak was not the only one offering source code material apparently. All the way back in 1999, even before the turn of the new millennium, an employee from Silicon Graphics was said to have released a bombshell of a leak, the Oman Archive. This archive supposedly contained the treasure trove of documents related to the N64's development, from planning documents, to hardware schematics, to straight up code for the software. It was a feast for indie gamers who took to building emulation software for the Nintendo 64 on top of the leaked source code, which ultimately allowed players from all walks of life to enjoy Super Mario 64 if only they had a basic PC and some know-how. You may have noticed, the employee came from a company called Silicon Graphics. Yes, that's THE Silicon Graphics we talked about earlier, the one I told you to remember. That's because Silicon Graphics, aka SGI, worked closely with Nintendo on the N64, providing the advanced hardware and software components that they believed they needed for the console to work. After SGI had convinced Nintendo to use their products, the collaboration team launched Project Reality. It was supposed to be an innovative, stunning new take on video games developed on literal supercomputers using bleeding edge programs. Did Project Reality succeed though? Well that's for you to decide. Project Reality eventually turned into the Nintendo 64. Middle Mario's textures? A silicon graphics design. The menu screen after booting up the game? A silicon graphics design. One observant commenter once said something that'll stick with me forever. The leaks have proved that Super Mario 64 is basically the world's best selling silicon graphics demo. So you think, with all of the success for the N64 and games like Mario 64, that SGI would be kinda set, right? Well, in 2009, the company filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy and faded away into corporate acquisition obscurity. To many, this is the curse of Silicon Graphics, faded to create one of the most enduring gaming experiences of all time, only to succumb itself not long after. If the personalization AI was ever real, as so many people have claimed, then perhaps it was the technology's initial developer, Silicon Graphics, that left the curse on Mario. So why don't we see any of this in the massive leak that occurred in 2020? Or the Oman Archive? Some say it's because Nintendo had the leak censored somehow. The actual answer is that there never was any personalization AI or spooky anomalies or anything like that at all. It was just never possible to do, realistically. But that doesn't ruin the game. One can still imagine, with a dash of childlike wonder, just what sort of new and unexpected experiences this magical game Still holds for us. ま、でのテレビゲームでは実現できなかったコンピューターグラフィックスアニメーションの世界。任天堂天童64ゲームが変わる。64が変える。so, you want to see what hides in the darkest depths of the Mario 64 iceberg? Good, you've made it this far, through all the previous levels. But do you think you can handle the strange secrets hidden within our beloved childhood game? Did you know that a sequel was in development before being scrapped entirely? What if Miyamoto stole the idea for Super Mario 64 from someone else? What if this game gave you nightmares, the exact same ones it gave all of your friends too? 
If you want to know the answers to these questions and more, then let us board Bowser's sub and finish our journey all the way down into the abyss of the Mario 64 iceberg. Have you ever wandered the castle, only to wonder to yourself why it was even designed that way, with all the hallways and rooms shooting off in odd directions that almost defy the structure you see from the outside? Was this on purpose, or did it just end up that way after the countless redesigns that led to the game's final version? It's a good question, because Super Mario 64 did indeed go through a number of versions before becoming the game we all know and love today. In the earliest versions we know about, Luigi was a playable character too. The castle was a bit smaller from the outside, and Peach's iconic stained glass window is just a generic window texture that can now be found on buildings in wet-dry worlds underwater town. The most drastic change, however, is the inside of the castle, where players inevitably end up spending most of their time in the game. The castle's beta interior featured a much darker color palette, platforms instead of stairs, and a less intuitive layout. We can only guess what the flooded basement section looked like exactly, since it seems that none of the promotional images sourced from the beta version showed it specifically, but it is considered a very important floor for the personalization AI lore. The tale goes that the basement was a testing ground for the personalization AI, a bit like a labyrinth that was changed by an eye in the sky of sorts, as the player played through the game which could give insights into how the AI should personalize the overall game for that player. Diligent fans have noted that the castle does seem to have gotten a bit larger in the final cut, which, to believers of personalization, is evidence that the AI had only grown since the beta, to include more features with which to test players. Navigating the castle can indeed seem a bit like navigating a maze, with so many locked doors, each with different requirements. Some players would inevitably be unable to make it past all of those doors, and thus speculation at what lay behind them could be the birthplace of much of this mythos. Imagining what the game really was is one thing, something that can be backed with research and hard evidence. What the game could have become, in a sequel however, is something that we have little more than imagination with which to rely on. The success of the Nintendo 64 saw the company seek to capitalize on expansions to the console. An infamous, ill-fated expansion, called the 64DD, was released in Japan. It looked to be about the same size as the console itself, but it would add the ability to play magnetic discs, which ended up looking a lot like cartridges anyways. Of course, bringing Mario to the 64DD was a no-brainer, and Mario Artist was one of the few titles to actually release on the console expansion. Nintendo wanted to bring their flagship title, Super Mario 64, to the 64DD as well, as a souped-up sequel that would launch the 64DD just as the original had done for the base console. This sequel project was called a lot of things, including just Super Mario 64 2, but the name that seems to have stuck through time is Super Mario 128, with 128 being twice the number 64. Miyamoto confirmed that this game was indeed in development, but mostly as an experimental project with a bunch of Mario models dropped onto a single spherical world at once. It never released, but according to Miyamoto, the game's development formed the foundations of what would later become Pikmin and Super Mario Galaxy. So it would appear that the sequel was never truly cancelled per se, but rather shaped into new games, no temporal tampering necessary. Speaking of Miyamoto, there's been a rumor going around for some time that Miyamoto and his team stole the ideas that ended up becoming Super Mario 64 straight from another team, Argonaut. The story appears to be that Argonaut pitched Miyamoto an idea for a 3D game based on Yoshi, which was alleged to have been very similar to the concept of Super Mario 64. Miyamoto turned the idea down, but ended up releasing Mario 64 not long after. Key people at Argonaut have confirmed that the ideas were indeed similar, but as far as I can tell, neither side has ever made any claims of ownership over the other project's concepts. In fact, Miyamoto even apologized to Argonaut for not picking up the Yoshi concept, since it did in fact turn out to be an ahead-of-its-time idea. If you've ever found yourself particularly and unusually drawn to the music used in Super Mario 64, then you are not alone. 
Koji Kondo does a wonderful job with the soundtrack for the game, but for some, Kondo's musical prowess does not fully explain why Mario 64's music was so... enchanting. Though not based in reality of any kind, there have been claims online that some of the samples used in the soundtrack were enchanted, i.e. magically imbued, to affect the listener in different ways. Of course, there's nothing mystical about the Super Mario 64 soundtrack other than that it is a wonderful piece of art. Not so wonderful, however, were the tales of nightmares amongst the youth who played the game. It is not uncommon for games to give children nightmares, so the fact that some players incorporated one of the most popular games of all time into their dreams should not come as much of a surprise. The part that was cause for concern among some players, however, were the tales of nightmares being shared between them, like a sort of infection of a sleeping mind. These days, the only stories of shared nightmares that remain from those times are those of Big Boo's Haunt, the spooky theme of which lends itself to such type of dreams, as well as beta versions of the penguins that found themselves on the box art for frosted mini-wheats back in the day. They are a little creepy, I'll give you that. The text string, Delicious Cake, can be found in the game's files, but it goes entirely unused. What was it for, you might wonder? Well, so far nobody seems to know the answer, but the common guess going around is that it might have been used on the end screen, which is indeed where a delicious cake appears. So even though the line was cut, the cake does still appear in the game. This cake was not a lie. There are some not-for-resale versions of Super Mario 64 cartridges that were distributed before and during the game's release for a number of reasons, from testing to promotion to previews and more. These NFR cartridges can be spotted by the not-for-resale text in the corner of the cart's label, but aside from this, there does not appear to be any discernible differences between the NFR cartridges and the final cuts of the game. That hasn't stopped fans from speculating on how the NFR version could be different, though. Lavender Town and Polybius are some of gaming's most popular urban legends. Lavender Town is the story of a town in the original Pokemon games that was purported to make children uneasy, even sick and nauseous. Some theorize this was some strange side effect of the music that played there, and some, of course, saw Pokemon as demonic. The true story is that Lavender Town never made anybody sick. The legend probably stems from the fact that the town is the home of a Pokemon graveyard and is haunted by their spirits. For a game where Pokemon don't seem to ever die, it was simply a jarring experience as a child. The arcade game Polybius was said to make players sick as well. Polybius cabinets were said to appear overnight, drive a few players mad, and then disappear with a couple of black suits behind it. Once again, this is a myth. Polybius never existed at all. Even still, the idea exploded into full-blown conspiracy, with some going so far as to even claim the game was testing or training for children of some sort administered by covert government entities. These two legends have several common threads with the story told on the Mario 64 iceberg and has gained a devoted following not unlike its predecessors as well. For instance, each of these legends claims the game could make you feel sick somehow. It is these similarities which may lead some to believe that they are connected, even seeming to imply that these stories were created to hide the fact that these effects supposedly occurred when playing Super Mario 64. We've made it all the way down the Mario 64 iceberg now, except for one more secret lurking below all others. The final piece of the iceberg's puzzle lay within the idea that every copy of Mario 64 is personalized. Nintendo 64 kommt und befreit die Videospiele aus ihrer flachen Welt durch ein sensationell neues 3D-Spielgefühl, super realistische Grafiken, Bewegungsfreiheit, die keine Grenzen kennt. Verschiedene Blickwinkel. Das ist die neue Freiheit des Spiels. Nintendo 64. The New Dimension of Fun. Saltar. Okay. Nadar. Okay. Volar. Okay. 
Ok. Super Mario 64. Ok. Busca el tu número en la etiqueta de Ok y llama. Puedes ganar una fantástica Nintendo 64 y el Super Mario 64. Every copy of Super Mario 64 is personalized. Or at least that's how the myth goes. So let's play Devil's Advocate by taking up the perspective of the believer for the purposes of this section. When you first slotted that cartridge into your old N64 and powered the game up, you became an unknowing participant in one of Nintendo's grandest experiments, the personalization AI. This AI was an experiment so great in scale that neither Nintendo nor Miyamoto developed it, and they certainly had only a modicum of control over it. That experiment affected all of us. It would change the game in subtle ways at first, moving a wall or a door a bit over to add some variety to the gameplay. Next, it would start to challenge you. It would alter levels in ways you never expected, and even used assets you'd never seen before on your copy, or anyone else's. Some of these changes were entirely benign, even unnoticeable. You'd walk right past one and not spare it a second thought. Some of those changes, however, guard new memories into your childhood brain. Things you don't often think about, but which you will remember forever. For some players, it manifested as the massive, ghostly head of Wario at the end of a dark hallway, taunting you as it gets closer, and faster, and faster. For others, it was entirely new paintings and stages, featuring a jumble of assets from throughout the game that made for an uncanny experience. So, if you ever played Mario 64 on an original cartridge, what was your experience? Compared to the lifespan of the original game that spawned the tales, the personalization AI seems to be a relatively new idea. While Super Mario 64 was released in 1996, which was 28 years ago at the time of recording, the every copy of Mario 64's personalized meme only really hits the keyword scene a bit over four years ago, in May of 2020. Perhaps not unsurprisingly, the Mario 64 iceberg keyword search trends follow directly on the heels of the beginning of the personalization trend. This is all due to the creepypasta, which is just a creepy copy and pasted story for those who might be unfamiliar, that was making the rounds on the internet at the time. The creepypasta was short, posted by Anonymous. It reads as follows. Every copy of Super Mario 64 is personalized. Nintendo's experimental AI adapts and subtly creates a slightly altered version of the game tailored specifically for you, appealing to you subconsciously in ways you don't even notice, as well as attempting to mess with you and study how you react to it. Have you ever played someone else's copy of Mario 64? Have you ever felt like something was just a little bit off? That's why. That's how. This is much more than just simple experimentation with procedural generation, however, there are many layers to this, and some of them are more sinister and malicious than others. Super Mario 64 is, at its core, an insidious and evil work of human creation. It was this story of Mario 64 personalization that became hooked in the minds of many, and it essentially led to the iceberg being posted in the first place, which is why it features so prominently at the bottom center of the original graphic. Though many dismissed the idea as a fun but deluded story, the nostalgia and appreciation for the game caught many others' attentions, and within days it was snowballing out of control. The Mario 64 iceberg and the story of the personalization AI that went along with it were soon shared outside of their typical image board homes where the idea had been incubating and growing into a full-fledged canon of its own. The audience of Twitter, Reddit, and YouTube, and the like caught wind of such a wild tale and that's when it spread like fire. Interest in the concept online peaks within the following months, largely thanks to how often it was shared on these platforms. For a time, people just couldn't get enough. While we can explain away most of the tall tales that cropped up during this period, it certainly didn't make it any easier to decipher since there was already an ongoing massive leak from Nintendo's assets going back decades. One of these assets was an unseen Luigi model hidden in the game's files, confirming that indeed, L is real after all. The cherry on top is the fact that the number that had always been associated with the phrase 2401 also coincides with the leak being released exactly 24 years and one month after the game was. To understand the personalization AI story, we need to understand how it is theorized to work in the first place. 
Yeah, yeah, look, I know. It's pretty ridiculous that anyone could ever hope to fit any sort of complex AI system into an N64 cartridge alongside a full game, which was already full of cut assets, but let's suspend our disbelief for just a moment for the purpose of this explanation. The legend goes that Nintendo, always looking to be on the cutting edge of gaming, either developed or acquired a complex artificial intelligence system, which they intended to deploy in their line of games. The Nintendo 64 was a leap in power for the Nintendo systems, and Super Mario 64 was considered a huge part of that first step, if not epitomizing the first step entirely as the console's flagship title. Teaming up with the computer's manufacturer Silicon Graphics Inc, aka SGI, known for developing some of the most powerful workstations at the time, the collaboration bore fruit with Project Reality, much of which went into the Nintendo 64's core development. The Mario 64 team appreciated Silicon Graphics computers so much that they even named a character after their favorite piece of hardware. SGI's MIPS processor is the namesake of MIPS the Rabbit. Because of this close collaboration, there are some that cite SGI as the progenitor of the personalization AI's unique coding, which Nintendo would have wanted to keep secret, even going so far as to tie it into the reason for why SGI filed bankruptcy and was bought out some years later, despite all of its successful ventures. One of my favorite wild hardware theories is the Nintendo Mega Connector idea, which I found on a wiki called The Secret Slide. Apparently, it would be a chip that was put into every N64 cartridge and allowed wireless connection to a secret satellite deployed by Nintendo for the purpose of supporting the AI wirelessly. I don't mean to sound rude, but you know you can open the cartridges up for yourself, right? There's only one small board inside, with only a few chips attached, and maybe an onboard battery sometimes. There is no mega connector inside, nor is there even the simplest of antennae. Wouldn't you just install it once on the console anyways, instead of in every single cartridge? Like, did no one open up the Mario cartridge at all and just go, Why is there a wireless transmitter system in here? And Mario's just like standing there with a bat in his hands like, Forget about it. No, but really, I'm sorry to be the one to break it to you. Gotta love those stories that start with, So I worked at Nintendo. And they get bonus points if it's like the dad or the uncle that worked there instead, when it's like a kid telling the story. Always gotta love that stuff. But no, there is no Nintendo Mega Connector. Sorry to burst your bubble. So, what were some of the things that were said to appear in the game when the personalization AI was at work anyways? One of the most common occurrences seems to be the castle's interior restructuring itself, usually moving walls and stairs into weird spots, sometimes turning one of the regular hallways into a dead end, and opening up other hallways to goodness knows where else. It's easy to see where people got this one from, because the castle interior does seem to have a strange layout already, and there are a number of spots that Mario can glitch into which trap him in the void if the player doesn't know how to get him out. Of course, we also have the stories of Luigi being an unlockable character you can actually play as, which I think just about all of us can relate to. When I was a kid, you couldn't go into me otherwise, even though I'd never so much as even heard a story about it yet. I definitely spent way too long staring at that plaque on the star statue in the castle courtyards found and wondering if it really said something about Luigi, and if so, what did it say? Well, the Luigi thing isn't as crazy as it sounds, not just because the files for him were found in the asset leak. Turns out, not long after the leak, previously lost footage from a beta demo before the game's release show a few seconds of Luigi playing right alongside Mario. Turns out it had been there the whole time. Naturally, Luigi wasn't the only Marioverse character that players figured absolutely had to be in the game. Wario's inclusion was always a popular theory, perhaps even more so than Luigi's. It had become such a meme, even as far back as the release in 1996, that Nintendo presented a panel at E3 that included an image of a large floating Wario head appearing in front of the Dire Dire Docks painting. Sound familiar? That's the Wario apparition, which has never been conclusively seen in game, but which many players attest to having experienced. Nintendo certainly didn't make it easier to disprove these theories by essentially kicking off the Wario apparition meme themselves, but hey, it's one of my favorite parts of the lore. One of the later popular additions to that lore is the White-Eyed Chain Chomp, which, as its name implies, is a version of the Chain Chomp with entirely white eyes. This change has been labeled as an omen of more personalizations to come, so if you see one, watch out. You could end up fighting a Blarg in Lethal Lava Land, or stumbling into the forest beyond the fences of Big Boo's Haunt, or even taking a trip to the islands in the distance, where who knows what happens. If the idea of going to a new stage appeals to you, or you just want to see stages you know so well as they once were in the old beta versions of the game, then thankfully there are plenty of fan creations to satisfy those curiosities. 
One of the most popular projects of late are the ROM hacks that recreate the beta gameplay found in the Shoshinkai or Space World demos from 1995, which was also seen in demo footage in various media leading up to the game's release. The Preservation Project is a faithful adaptation of this demo gameplay, essentially allowing players today to get much of the same experience that gamers almost three decades ago would have had while anticipating the latest Mario title. On the other hand, B3313 is an infamous ROM hack that ends up being a monster of a game in its own right. It takes the beta designs and then ups the ante, adding hundreds of power stars to collect and tons of features that will certainly make you feel like you're playing a heavily personalized copy of Super Mario 64. Such ROM hacks have inspired spooky video series like SM64 Classified, which follow gameplay that is said to have occurred in these highly personalized copies of the game. One of the most common characters, a textureless Mario that essentially appears with no face, was even dubbed Stanley and adopted as a sort of mascot for the AI. I'd also like to shout out the beta archive, which provides tons of great footage, music edits, and more in this beta Mario 64 style. Thank you, beta archive. Well, 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 you did it. You've gone all the way down the Mario 64 iceberg, past cackling Wario heads and wide-eyed chain chomps, past those featureless Mario models and the deep cover AI with an agenda, and you've made it back to the surface unscathed. Impressive. Now that you're a resident expert on all the spooky and secretive inner workings of Super Mario 64, how about we switch up to something a bit more lighthearted? I've been practicing with some of my favorite games, including SM64 and Donkey Kong Arcade version, and I've been able to achieve some respectable speeds and scores. I've even finally got a solid pacer of a run on my Mario 16 star route and set a huge new personal best. Join me on my speedrunning journey by clicking the video recommended on screen now. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to leave a quick like and subscribe if you want to see more. Thanks for watching. I'll see you on the next video.